Ladies and gentlemen, the program is about to begin. Please take a moment to silence your mobile devices. We would like to remind you that food and drink are not permitted in the theater. Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Merkin Hall at Kaufman Music Center. This is our second season as a Times Talks venue partner, and it's a relationship that we are extremely proud of. Uh, I'm Amy Frawley, the director of Merkin Hall. This intimate space that's perfect for, for music and conversation, especially tonight's between the one and only MIA and Milena Reitzik, who's a culture reporter for the New York Times. The mission of this center is to transform lives through music and dialogue around the arts, culture, and social issues relevant to today, the time, and the place in which we live. Um, I invite you to pick up one of our season brochures on your way out and take a look at it. There is lots going on here. In addition to three more talks this fall with the Times, um, see a concert, take a class here, Come for another intriguing discussion, and now settle in for a most thought-provoking evening. Thank you for being here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the Director of Programming for the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks. For 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, literature, and social justice. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with musical artist and activist Maya Arul Pragazim, also known as MIA. From international pop star to political provocateur, MIA is unapologetically female, artistically driven, and daringly different. Maya joins us tonight for a discussion about our upcoming film, Matangi Maya MIA. Drawn from a cachet of personal tapes shot by Maya and her closest friends over the last 22 years, the film captures her remarkable journey from immigrant teenager to international pop sensation. Moderating tonight's conversation is New York Times roving culture reporter, Milena Reisig. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Milena Reisig and MIA. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm so happy to be here with you and with Maya. It's been a minute. Thanks for having me. Yes. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about the movie and about your history, and uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for audience Q&A, and there will be some mics on either side of the aisle here. So if you guys have a question, line up at the mic so everybody here in the room and out in internet land can hear you. Thank you. Um, thanks again for joining us, and congrats on the film. It has been a long labor of love, right? Yes, even the release. So finally it's coming out tomorrow. Uh, yeah, eight years in the making. What made you think this is the right time to release something like this? Uh, it's just how long it took Steve to make it. <laughs> it really is, yeah. So this is an unusual documentary when it comes to stories about artists. It's not the typical, you know, talking head, tour footage. It's based on a lot of footage that you shot yourself. In fact, there's 700 hours of footage that you shot throughout your life, like a lot of kids, I think, in the 80s and 90s, myself included, just glued to a camcorder, right? When you were growing up? Uh, yeah, I also wanted to be a documentarian, so that's what I studied. Um, yes, I just had tons of footage of anything that I tried to, to make a documentary on. And yeah, on the back end of all those tapes, there were you know, stuff that I'd shoot at home or um, just of myself doing things, but 
there was sort of to finish the tape off. Um, but yeah, it, it was never to sort of, I never thought those bits would be the bits in the film, but within the tapes, there's lots of footage that was to do with the documentaries that I tried to make, yeah, which Steve didn't use, <laughs> yeah. Should we watch a little bit of the trailer to give you guys a glimpse if you haven't seen it already? Let's do that. You wanna hear my story? I'm gonna show you my story. What's that song about? Stereotype that's attached to like human courses and stuff like that <laughs> is that they come and take the jobs and take the money. A liberal war came as a refugee that is now a pop star. What are the goalposts? The worst thing they could do to you is to make you irrelevant. What experience are we allowed to share from these places? You've got access to a microphone. Please use it to say something. Yeah, it's a long trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably an average length trailer, but it's probably a lot to see so much of your own history on screen that way. You grew up, it sounds like, being comfortable putting yourself on camera, but how does it feel now to see some of these things that you have said you never thought would see the light of day out in the well, world Well, there this is way? a bit in that trailer where I'm talking about the New York Times. <laughs> so this is a very special night for me. And for me. <laughs> but it will make more sense tomorrow when you watch the film. Um, yeah, so that is, it is strange because it is very personal. So, yeah. I think for a lot of us, like seeing our 14 year old dance moves on a big screen is not something we yeah, want to. My, yeah, my friend, I felt is slightly passive aggressive, so he really pulled out all the worst shots. <laughs> it's not a film you go to see for fashion, definitely not, or art and graphics or whatever, you know, those kind of creative things you might be into. But it's very much about the story and a human journey, and he really doesn't care about the rest of it. And yeah, you, you would know what I mean when you watch it. Does it feel though, I mean, and I, I will say also like, I t have to disagree with you because I think that your, your dance moves actually are really fresh in the movie and I can see no, the connection. No, I really thought I was a really good dancer until I saw the movie <laughs> and now I quit music and don't dance. <laughs> I don't know, I could see the connection between the way you perform on stage and some of the stuff that you were pulling as a, as a 10 year old in your parents' living room. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so I don't know how to take that. But yeah, in my head, you know, they felt like I was doing backflips and stuff like that, yeah. That's the confidence that we should all have as 10-year-old and 12-year-old girls. Um, about, we're talking about your, your, your friend and director, Steve Loveridge, that you, that you gave this footage to. Um, as an artist who's spent a long time working on all of your material, how did it feel to cede that kind of control over to, to him? Well, um, I've known him for a long time and I know that he is incredibly um, empathetic and patient. And I think those two uh, characteristics you need to be a documentary filmmaker. And also, um, you know, what I realized is that when you're misunderstood and then you become famous for being misunderstood and you're the most misunderstood musician, then it sort of has to be about um, somebody knowing you that makes it. And so all of those things kind of just lined up and he, um, you know, obviously went to film school with me and I know how uh, meticulous he is about 
making films because he, you know, he's very critical, self-critical, more than, you know, oh, he's the worst self-critic. So I, I knew he'd make something that was good and it wasn't um, just to sell a product or an album or, you know, he really shies away from the industry and he couldn't... There's actually a shot of him in the documentary around 2009 when I get nominated for an Oscar and I invited him to LA and he ran away because he couldn't hack it. And so I know that he's not about the sort of entertainment of it, but is much more about a human journey and is, is, is sort of motivated by different goals, yeah. Well, as somebody who studied documentary film yourself, you must know that also the connection between filmmaker and subject is really sacred and a, a sense of trust is really important there. And it sounds like you guys had that. But what made you want to do a documentary in general? Was it to get back some of the sense of, you mentioned being a misunderstood artist, was it to tell your own story? Well, actually what it's turned into is that it tells my own story, but within the context of um, something that affects many people today. But in the beginning, I really wanted to, this is when I got into a fight with New York Times, it was about a, a, a time when the internet was being manipulated, which was 2010, and that's when I handed the tapes over to him, because I'd just had the fight with New York Times, and they just did the great takedown. And then I had to go on tour with my new baby, and um, it was like the darkest days, because the, the reality of the Civil War um, had come to an end just months before, and 400,000 people had been bombed, um, and people were put in camps, and women were being, you know, and children were being um, abused or sexually assaulted and raped. People were get, getting, you know, killed in these camps as well. Um, the government was successful in having carried out a very clever, well um, planned out internet um, campaign, you know, using Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica tactics, but they had a different agency called Bell and Pottinger at the time. And I, I, I got to know all that and learn all that because from first-hand experience, unlike any other musician out there, which I am totally, you know, can say. Um, so as a musician, it was a very weird place to be in. Right, you were at the height of your success. I was height of my success. And attention, you had a new baby. The, and whole, the, the whole war I've been talking about my entire career came right, to an Sri end Lanka. the yes. same year. And they pushed 400,000 people into a strip and bombed them. And I was the only person that was a Tamil celebrity in the world, in Western media, talking about it and you know and papers like the New York Times didn't help me and they judged me and slandered it instead and then I had to go on tour and it was maybe six months or yeah maybe six months after that article where WikiLeaks had come to light for the first time and released the documents that said yes there had been a war crimes um, committed and the UN knew about it. And that was the first time, you know, I was sort of given anything from the media that validated what I'd said. So it was just like the dark period and that's really what I wanted to make a film about. Yeah. Well, the Sri Lankan government during the Civil War was very effective at keeping journalists out and keeping international peacekeepers out and that was part of their tactic. And one of the ways that the Civil War 
ended um, included that, those kind of tactics. And it, it certainly was clearly a, a really tension-filled place for you to be in as an artist and as a person who was a spokesperson, a spokesperson for your country and heritage. Yeah, it was, um, was kind of interesting because the one of the army commanders who were actually um, wanted for war crimes became the ambassador at UN, you know, the, and the representative for Sri Lanka. And the, it, it was just mind blowing, you know, and I was seen as like the bad guy and which, you know, hence I put out bad girls after that, I suppose. But that, that I was like the villain and he was the good guy who worked at the UN and Right, it was a very, it's certainly a very complicated situation. It's very complicated. And, I mean, I can't even tell that you whole taken thing the time. in a documentary, yeah. you know. So I think the documentary is way more light uh, and, and easier to digest than actually what had happened because you would need more than 90 minutes to really get into it. Absolutely, you know? but one of the most moving parts um, of the film is some footage that you shot yourself in 2001 when you went back to Sri Lanka um, when you were 25, I think, right? And you hadn't been back for a number of years since you left as a kid, and you went there to try and make um, a documentary about your family. Can we show um, a clip of that, please? When I was your age, I used to live in this room. Ning in the room, Cliff. Mom, tell me. The time for the number one. Eh. Huh? Eh. And then I'm wonder kekla. Anger London the cars at the mangal, when the camera and thunder, cash the party in a mandir at the Kundava and the son of one. Sumadeka, please. Ungle or a thunder and a decay black cash the party one the night. You know, I haven't seen my family for 16 years, and I'm having to spend a lot of time with them off camera and get them to be comfortable with me and get them to understand what my personality is like, because when they see me, they straight away assume that I'm a Tamil girl and I'm into the same things as everybody else, and they sort of suggest taking me out to the shopping mall. You know, and it's really difficult for me to get across the point that I'm not interested in those things, and it's kind of, um, that's not why I'm here. So, did you have a sense, like a lot of immigrants do, like I'm an immigrant and I did, certainly, of otherness as you were growing up? Otherness from the place that you ended up being raised, which was England, and otherness from this culture that you were visiting? Yeah, um, yeah, when I left, I was 10, and the two little kids, which I realized my T-shirt matched their curtain in that shot, but those two kids that were living there, my whole family lived in that room uh, just before we came to England, and, and that was the first time going back there, and I, haven't, I had, still haven't gone back to the exact house that I lived in in Jaffna because I never made it to the north during that time. Um, but yeah, the, the, the family that I'd met around, around, you know, in that scene, they were always like, oh, you don't, you, you, you're not one of us anymore, you know. And the stuff that's not in that shot is everyone trying to sort of like make me into this kind of... Um, uh, sort of just blend in with with the Tamil girls in Colombo because when you're Tamil in Colombo, you're just a, a lot more invisible or you try to be. And they wanted to sort of comb my hair. My mum was worried because I had bleached hair and a lot of tiger girls in the jungle have, um, you know, slightly brown hair because they've been in the sun every day. And... So it was just little things, and I had that Puma T-shirt on, so 
they, they were like, you're obviously not from here because you can't wear something like that and you would get shot. And it was kind of, um, yeah, I was, I was sticking out like a sore thumb. And so I sort of start trying to fit in. But you do realize that there is, you know, you're in an incredibly privileged position and it's, and it doesn't work to also impose your thing on them where I'm like, why don't you, you know, just like live and be really loud and be confident, walk down the street and do your hair or do your nails. And, you know, I was playing them CDs of songs that I liked and trying to teach them just normal sort of youth culture stuff that kids could be into. And they were just like, no, we don't want to draw any attention to us. And you can't look nice when you walk down the street because you, you, know, you might attract the soldiers and you don't know what they'll do to you. And so, yeah, there was this sort of weird, you know, I had a very like romantic idea about what I was going there to do as a filmmaker and to make this sort of youth culture documentary to find out what the difference was between living in England and living there. And yeah, so I just, I just didn't fit in both, both ways. Because if you watch the documentary before I go, I, you know, I sort of say, oh, I can't live in London anymore because it's too superficial and I need to go and do something meaningful. And then when I get there, my meaningful wasn't meaningful enough you know, because I just was not prepared for all the stories that I came across. And and I wasn't like this truly kind of politically educated, um, you know, Oxbridge blah. And I was, I was like an art school filmmaker and they'd never come across that. And it's, yeah, it's kind of, I think, you know, then I realized a lot of people are like that. There's actually a million um, Tamil diaspora abroad. And, you know, it's sort of then, if you zoom out, it's actually a lot of immigrants everywhere feel the same. They're always connected to two different cultures and they're always sort of pulled by these things. You say later, shortly after that clip in the movie, that what you're seeing over there is become, becoming part of you, and you don't know if you can leave, and you ended up extending your stay, and this was right before there was like a brief ceasefire in the war. So looking back now, you said this, this is getting in my head, and I don't know how it's going to affect me. Looking back now, how do you think that trip affected you? Um, yeah, it, it did really affect me, but I think every bit of it affected me. That, that trip specifically affected me because I came face to face with the struggle of communication and how silent the, the Tamils were. And the only time when they ever got any space in the news was through violence you know, and that if it's not through violence, they weren't being heard. And so my uncle, who worked for Amnesty International for 20 years before I, I went there, and I'd filmed a lot, a lot of stuff that um, he'd done, um, he reported some of the most gruesomest things I've ever heard in my life. And it just seemed just because the government was the government and the government was the establishment, they were allowed to get away with so much things that were completely illegal and outrageous. And the Tamils, because they were branded as the terrorists, no matter how like um, disciplined they were, um, they could ne never shake the stories about them, you know, so the government could, under the pretext of PTA, could do anything they wanted and actually engage in ethnic cleansing or genocide, and it would never get questioned. Um, because the, the tigers were just then labeled terrorists. And so the PTA law was just implemented in Sri Lanka when I was there. And 
the census report was happening when I was there. And so that was the first time I realized, like, oh, if you leave out the 400,000 people from the census report, because the government decided that's what they should do, um, that 10 years from now, you're not going to be able to account for the 400,000 people, because there's no record of them. Well, and the, the Tamils are the, the minority in, yes. in Sri Lanka. Um, but, you know, one thing that's fascinating about your um, family history is that it comes through in the movie that uh, there's a moment where you talk with your siblings about your family connection to the Tamil Tigers, um, and there's a divergence of opinion. You know, your, your siblings are saying, you're, you grew up in, in the UK, your dad stayed behind in, in Sri Lanka to continue his work um, uh, with the Tamil Tigers, or involved in that world, and your siblings kind of say, I, I wish I had had a dad around, you know, he could have sent a card, and you had a different, a different opinion. Yeah, my dad had a movement called Eros, which was Elam Revolutionary Organization of Students. But my dad was the main guy that, that kind of came up with a manifesto that even the Tigers kind of used. And the Tigers eventually got rid of his group because they were larger in um, number and also they had different sort of, you know, beliefs. And, and then my dad became a mediator. But... The Tigers, though, were the only group that was functioning at the time when I went. And my dad, um, yeah, my, my, well, myself, in the earlier shots, I was so westernized, and I hadn't gone back to Sri Lanka at that point, that even I was like, oh, this is what it's like when your dad's a terrorist, you know, because I'm also reading newspapers in the West, and I'm like, oh, if this is what makes you a terrorist, then... My dad is a terrorist, you know. And only when I went to Sri Lanka, I start understanding that it's not so simple, you know. And this is before 9-11, so it's very difficult to come back from a place like that and have conversations with your friends or anybody, really, because it hadn't happened, you know. And, and that concept of... Um, freedom fighter versus terrorist hadn't happened yet on a wider level, you know. Well, it may, may have happened, you know, in the U.S. in the 60s during the civil yeah. rights movement. Um, it didn't have the context that you're talking about now. But did you, looking back now, do you still feel that way? You know, your siblings felt like it would have been good to have our dad in our life, and your brother says in the film, I wasn't even sure what he was fighting for. Do you still feel like he did the right thing? Um, yeah, I think I am proud of my dad for having had a go at, you know, defining um, uh, an identity for Tamils and trying to make that space, you know. I think that since the war had ended in 2010, uh, 2009 to now, you can tell that, you know, what, what did the Tamils get in return for not fighting, you know? And the international community is like, put the white flag up, you know, your terrorist is over, so put the white flag up and um, nothing's gonna happen to you. They put the white flag up and everyone got killed and all the civilians got killed, and then all the Tamils went into camps, and then, you know, nobody knows what happened. And still to this day, no one's been, you know, prosecuted or taken to court over anything that's happened. And the news this week is that, um, is that they're actually gonna get rid of the International Criminal Court. The entire court system is gonna go, not only the concept of ever trying someone for war crimes, or, you know, when the government um, is oppressive, there's no way to question it now. So had the Tamils known that 10 years ago, you know, I think, I think we would have tried to define what, what 
our space looked like and what our identity looked like. Maybe not through war and maybe not through fighting, but I think we would have been a bit more vocal. And because the only flag they had was the Tamil Tiger flag, people got shut down, you know, and it was very difficult to go through that and not have um, any international media there to cover some of the outrageous right. things. Well, there, that there have been there has been there have been stories that have come out, you know, certainly in the aftermath of the war, that talked about the the injustices and how brutal it was on both sides. So I think that some of that story has certainly gotten out. But I want to go back to something that you mentioned about you know the idea that that when you went to Sri Lanka in that first visit as an adult, and you realized that your community was silenced in a way. Do you think that that was something that made you feel like I better have a bigger voice? Uh, no, I think that that is what's interesting about it, is somewhere in the 70s, you know, when I was born, that's when my dad went back to Sri Lanka and um, started training people in 1975. And during 75, he was on the farm with Prabharan, who's the leader of the Tamil Tigers, and Prabharan went one way, which was to fight through extremism uh, and violence. And my dad was m way more sort of international, kind of intellectual and democratic. Uh, and he went towards sort of trying to change it in different ways. And he, the outcome through his choices made his kids end up in London and one became a pop star. But in 2009, Prabharan's son was shot the same week that I was at the Oscars, you know. So both of these men produced children and one was there in, in, in Sri Lanka who'd chose the route of violence and the other one chose the route of art and, you know, Western democracy. And both of us at that moment were experiencing the ends of what those threads led to, you know, and which is what, is the pinnacle of, you know, the New York Times article is, is that art doesn't work with politics and, and neither does um, a, a minority group fighting an oppressive regime. Well, you have tried throughout your career to reflect your, your heritage, your culture, certainly talk about the Civil War um, in your music like a lot of female artists, you have not always been given your due as a songwriter and producer, but we do get to see a little bit of your work um, on that front in the movie. So let's watch a little bit of that and we'll talk about it. I went to practically every continent. We kept working on the same song in every country. So I started recording music in Trinidad. You had to make it make sense to the Trinidadians. So it would change slightly. And then I recorded some stuff in Jamaica. And you would have to adjust it again when you bring him to Brooklyn. The kid in a village in Corvillum where we shot the bird flu video and the kid in Liberia playing on that playground is exactly the same. And they have nursery rhymes and they play games. They have an opinion about what kind of hairstyle they want and what t-shirt they're going to put on in the morning. And they have dreams and they have like an idea of what they want to be. There's some happy bits in the film. 
Did you guys catch the t-shirt that those kids were wearing in there? Goat rich or get trying, die trying? I kind of want one of those. Um, um, how do you know when a song is finished, if you're recording it in so many places and, and um, getting influences and ideas from so many places? Uh, yeah, on, on the Kala album, it just kept going until, you know, I just sort of like landed back in America and then it finished. Um, but yeah, it took the whole cycle of not having the visa and I was traveling around, yeah. So it's not like a, a sound or a moment that you realize in the recording room usually? Uh, no, I think, you know, it's never finished really because you could always do more to it, yeah. Do you come to the studio with a notebook full of songs already written or do you write when no. you're there? Sometimes, but I used to be like that. But now I think I try to write on the spot and yeah, if it doesn't work, then I go home. Um, very few people are prepared for the level of stardom that, that you achieved. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you felt <clears throat> when you realized that you had gotten to that level. I mean, there's a moment in, in the film where you're at Coachella. I think your first performance at Coachella and the crowd wants an encore and you're like, what do I do? <laughs> Which I thought was very sweet. Yeah, I didn't quite compute it at the time. But I didn't... Um yeah, I mean, we tend to talk about how many people hate me, but we never really talk about, you know, the people who did like it. And <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Even, you know, even like my fans are like, come on, I bought your record. Like, stop complaining. And it is true, there were journalists that were supportive and there were people that got it and there were fans that were supportive. I mean, your albums and were hits. You had hit songs. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of weird that I, 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 you know, it was shocking because I went to the record label in England and I signed and I made this record and everyone was coming around to the offices saying, we, we don't know where to put this record because it makes no sense. And what genre is it? Is it electronic? Is it hip hop? Is it dance music? Is it world music? And world music at the time had such a like, bad reputation and it was really boring. But I love it. <laughs> but people just were so judgmental about it and they always put it at the back shelf at the back of the shop. And yeah, so we were like, no, it shouldn't go in the back of the shop. And, it, you know, and I was trying to fight for it to be on the till. And they didn't agree, so it just didn't get put in enough record shops. It was very selective. And, you know, I heard a story that even Jack White, because um, he was signed to XL at the time, had made it, and he was like a huge celebrity at the time, that, that, they sold none of my records that they sent it to Jack White XL for, for him to use as like target practices in <laughs> Nashville where he lived. And that's what they were using my records for. God, I hope that's true. That's an amazing story. It's fucking true. <laughs> well, and, I wonder, is and, he a good you know, shot? That's really interesting because that's, there you go, someone, you know, where you're in a country where guns are allowed and you've got shooting ranges in your backyard. <laughs> and, you know, everyone had a problem with the record because it was talking about, you know, violence somewhere else. And it was just so weird. <laughs> and, then, and then I was on a plane with Jack White doing the Big Day Out tour in Australia. And... I was sat in the row behind him on an aeroplane, and, and that on that tour, you have to travel around together with all the bands to all the cities in Australia. And uh, they were headlining, and I was like a little, you know, thing on the side. And when I got up to pee on the plane, he was like, put your box cutter away. I made a joke. <laughs> and I was like... It's like a, you know, it's obviously a thing. And so, yeah, we had a little bit of a kind of, I, 
don't think I talked to him after that. <laughs> but we were on the same, you know, we were label bu buddies. But then, you know, after that, it started picking up because of the internet. And suddenly MySpace happened and, you know, all of these kind of, um, uh, yeah, just blogs. That's, that's really who made me, bloggers, like back in the day, you know, students and bloggers that nobody cared about or was looking at. And they were able to have this thing for the first time where I could talk about the craziest things or craziest ideas and people could Google it, you know, and that even though the older generation and the execs were like, what are you talking about? Um, the younger kids found that there was enough to, to Google and, you know, they can actually go, where is Sri Lanka and what is she talking about and what's Galang? And it was, it was sort of a thing and, and I think that sort of, um, it sort of built the identity as well, you know, of, of the aesthetic of blogs and back in the day kind of. You introduced a lot of people to the idea of salting and peppering a mango. Salting and peppering the mango, yeah. And, you know, not kind of, yeah, and, and the clashing of genres as well is, is, is it could happen because of the web, because people listen to music and they were streaming music, uh, not streaming, but bootlegging, downloading, uh, from lots of sites. So you would have your playlist and also iTunes, it just happened. So you would have all of your music in one space and it, it, it wasn't like vinyls where you put one record at a time and listen to it and the whole album and flip it over. And, you know, it, I don't know, the way you understand music was different on yeah. the web. And it was such an open space and also an uncharted territory. I wonder if we have people in our audience here who are pre-iTunes, a lot of people who are only post-iTunes and pre-iTunes. Wait, okay. there's, there's pre-iTunes. There's some pre-iTunes. The original But are there post-iTunes people here? Only post-iTunes? But see, okay, this is, this is what happened in 210. In 210, this blogging culture got bought up and corporatized and monetized. And all the small blogs had to join up with bigger blogs. And then the bigger blogs then joined the bigger blobs. You know, <laughs> and it was it was a very sad thing for me because I'd felt like so, you know, so attached to it and and but did felt you part of it. Did you, know? you ever do that yourself? Did what? you ever write online any blog? Did I write on blogs? Yeah. No, but I think I fed them a lot. You know, just with so much complicated stuff <laughs> that it helped people think about random things, <laughs> and and then they were like, "Oh, thank God, my life is so much more easier." You know? <laughs> it was like, as compared to your songs, what what kind of sounds are you attracted to now? Um. I don't know, I mean, musically, I'm just still experimenting. I'm, I'm not really sure if I want to make another album or something, and I want to try to, try to maybe, you know, if music is quite a complicated thing, then right now, because the music industry has changed, and, you know, the same thing, the thing that we're talking about, blogging culture, is the same thing happened to, to music. And going back to the blogging culture, right, because it's, it's just like I haven't been able to talk about this for a while, and is the other thing I wanted to say is that I got big because nobody knew, knew about it, and the Sri Lankan government didn't know about it, and it took a while for them to catch up. But when they did catch up, those are the spaces that they started entering, and leaving comments and, you know, sort of manipulating that. And that's kind of when I learned about how that could be a really a, a negative thing for society in the future, 
you know. Well, Sri Lanka is still today, you know, although the war has been over since 2009 and the country is in some ways healing, it's still a very dangerous place for journalists. It's one of the most dangerous places for journalists, according to the committee. And just normal civilians, yes, if you're they're, Tamil. They're, do you feel, would you go, have you been back there? Do you feel welcome there? Uh, no, in 210 they said that if I go there, they'd have a grave waiting for me. But that was Rajapaksha. Uh, the since previous then, president's yeah, regime, yeah. who was the president during the Civil War. Yeah, since then, um, I don't know, you know, it's the number one country in the world for missing persons and abductions. So I, I wouldn't really take a chance because, yeah. I made a joke saying I'm called MIA, so it's like <laughs> obvious that it might just happen. And yeah, and I, I just don't want to sort of risk it. And and I have thought about becoming a reality TV star because that would be the only way I could get there and come out alive. But I don't know if I'm that entertaining. <laughs> like... I think you're that entertaining, right guys? <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking if I could just, you know, get a show like the Kardashians and then I go there and get a film 24-7, that, that, yeah, that, that would be quite fun. When I went to the Canada event a couple of years ago, um, somebody from America came up to me and said, we'll provide security for you to go. But I was like, no way. <laughs> like, that felt like, yeah, the... The documentary hadn't come out, and there was loads of people that still hated me, and I was like, no, um, I wouldn't take that risk. But lots of people I know do go there, and, you know, they're trying to sort of... Um, they're trying to sort of work out how to rebuild the society, and... Um, you know, build Tamil identity after it's been sort of like worn down for 40 years. And, but, but it's very difficult because Sri Lanka, Sri La the Sri Lankan army is actually bigger than the United Kingdom's army post-war. So from 2010, the army has doubled and now it's bigger than, it, the, you know, the British military, which is really saying something. And I mean, it is like we, we mentioned, it is a country that has sort of, you know, there's still problems, obviously, there are quite a lot of problems there, but it is on the path, path to healing. Uh, well, I don't ways. know, it's difficult because in the Vanni area where they took the 400,000 people, uh, the, um, the ratio is two soldiers to one civilian. Yeah, so I don't know how you heal when you've got a gun to your head every day and it's been 10 years, and the whole world has, like, forgotten you, and, you know... We're here talking about it. We're, we're here talking about it, and thank you, Steve, for making the film, <laughs> finally. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure there's the UN down the road, and I'm sure the, you know, Singhalese government's saying a totally different story, like, everything's great, we got Starbucks, <laughs> and, you know... Everyone's got iPhones. Do you feel hopeful, though, about the future of the country? Um, I will if they've at least convicted one single person for any, you know, war crimes or sexual offense or, you know, anything that's happened over the last 10 years. And I would think that if the government, the, the current government, came up on any of the promises they made to the Tamil people... And, you know, if, if some of the North is demilitarized and if they give some of the land back to the Tamils, then I think, yes, there's progress. But instead, since the war, we're $65 billion in debt to China and we're building crazy, you know, ego buildings, the biggest airport in the world in the middle of the jungle, which is the emptiest airport in the world, and it lands one plane a day. Yeah. And so we're now, like, in this crazy debt we're going to have to pay off with cheap labor, I guess, you know. So it just looks like 
the only future the Tamils really have is to to become, you know, literally just low-paid workers and slaves to to build this economy that's in debt. So I don't know. I'm not that hopeful on that level, you know. But but I am hopeful for the million Tamils who are outside the diaspora, and I think they they would if they get involved, which the government's sort of embracing the idea that they let more of the diaspora kids come back and get involved. If they go back, then I think that's, you know, that something could change. Right, people are coming back. I think that, that definitely is happening. I want to have some time for audience questions, but, but I, I want to talk about one idea that, we, that you brought up a couple times that came out of the New York Times article. Um, that was in the New York Times Magazine that you've referenced several times, which is the idea that art cannot um, have an impact politically. And uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that idea. I'll say that I think that it can have an impact politically, and if it doesn't, then it sort of obviates a lot of the work that I do as somebody who talks about culture um, and hopes that talking about culture and having conversations with all of us here um, introduces people to new ideas and explains the ideas of artists who are in some time, in some cases, pushing culture forward in new directions and hopefully more open and welcoming directions. Um, so I do think that art can have a place in changing the world because otherwise, it's certainly wonderful to enjoy art as a viewer, as an audience member. It's cathartic, it's pleasure filled, but hopefully there is a larger message. And I think, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And then we'll get to you guys having questions. I mean, I, I don't know. This is what you have to answer me because the, the, the sort of monetized music industry and the film industry, it exists in America. You know, if, if you're talking about film, the, the, the dominant sort of industry is Hollywood. You know, there's Bollywood and I guess... Nollywood. Hollywood. And Nollywood. And Nollywood. They were in Nigeria, yeah. Um, but, yeah, they all take from Hollywood, I guess. Um, and the music industry as well. And also the distribution and the award system and everything. So it's just really American-based. So I think it is important to have that discussion here more than anywhere else. Um, but, yeah, like, do you think it is possible to be... Um, political when it is so tied up with the establishment or tied up with with also a political kind of agenda you know th this is exactly why someone like me got into fights as an artist is not because my art wasn't good you know and I had to literally invent a whole new genre in order to exist you know to 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 kind of be um, that effective, I suppose, and you had to come with a whole new style, and then you had to make your own stuff and a whole new visual aesthetic and all of this stuff, and you had to kind of come out with this thing. And I felt like my politics, because it wasn't the right politics, is the only reason that was you know, people like, edit your politics out, it doesn't work. But all of the other stuff, influences got borrowed. Like, if you look at the mainstream now, a lot of it does borrow from some of the stuff that happened 10 years ago, you know, in my music, whether it's like the, you know, whatever phase. Um, but... Well, culture always recycles. I mean, that's one of the ways it looks back, it changes, it, does, it takes but the thing ideas. Is it didn't take my politics. And that's one of the things that we were talking about with Lynn Hirschberg is everybody wanted to wear the leggings and wear the like neon crazy prints or whatever, or listen to weird beats, but they didn't want the politics, you know? And that's kind of what Diplo was saying in the articles too, going, I told her to shut up about politics and she'd be way more famous. And yeah, and it was like really annoying. And look at him now. <laughs> but, like, but anyway, the thing is, it's just so like 
it, it was, the struggle was like, if your politics is the wrong politics, it's, you can't be political. And, but and we are living in a different moment right now, I think. Yes, and Luckily, that's why we I'm have here. come to the place where we can talk <laughs> about ideas and talk about revolution and also make good music at the same time. So uh, on that note, I will leave it to the audience to bring up their questions. We're going to have those mics, so please line up behind the mics if you can, and I'll call on you guys. Okay, oh, we have a lot of questions. Okay, I may not get to everybody, but I will start over here on the left, on my left. Hey, hey I'm a big fan, it's great Hi. to see you. Yeah, um, as an up and coming artist, what, do you, what advice do you have as far as artists that wanna have a lot of political messages and be independent, not like work with big labels and stuff, what's your advice? I think this is like a really like a brand new honeymoon period for that. And, you know, it feels like the, um, you know, everything's so up in the air in, in America at the moment politically that it's a great time for art, you know. And I think when you are being political with your art, you should really be fair and not get, get, into the herd mentality because that is also happening because of the nature of social media and, you know, them being greedy. Uh, and you can say it, we're just on the internet. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Them being really greedy motherfuckers <laughs> that, you know, they really like sold that um, diversity in, in um, just the way to think and 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 be, and I feel like this is a great time because they've both peaked. You know, you saw the edge of social media, and you've seen the edge of politics, and you've seen the edge of greed. You know, because you've got Donald Trump, and you've seen the edge of celebrity, and so it's a great time to begin again and redefine what all those things mean and be conscious also of how it affects the rest of the world this time because I think up to this point Americans weren't very conscious that they affected or their entertainment and culture affected stuff around the world you know and or if it did it was a one-way conversation and I think it's a, it's a good time to re, re sort of think about that. It's time for us to listen. Thank you um, so much. Uh, on that note, I will ask everybody, please keep your questions short so I can at least attempt to Hi. get everybody in. Hi. I was in England uh, last week watching a documentary, right, with you. And I was so proud of you being part of your family, being your cousin. And, um, I haven't seen her for 30 years. I know. She last saw me when I was 11. Yes, yes, I did. And yeah. she was, a, she was a, a ball of energy. She was, oh God, it's incredible. But the, the movie, the documentary I watched, it was incredible. Even I myself learned so much. And one of the things that I loved about you is you have embraced the Western culture in such a way that as a, a Sri Lankan, and of course, I can call myself American because uh, naturally, but I don't think I could speak like you, like how you would use an F word and this word and that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's incredible. I is it an English habit or it's an American habit? I do not know what it is. <laughs> well, this is why I'm like a Tamil outcast, but then I came back, you know, because I, 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 I did get ostracized by the Tamil community for swearing and cutting my hair and things that just... But I think it's spirit, it's incredible. I would like to know how you would bring up your son as an American or English or Sri Lanka. Mm. All of it, you know. All of it. I call him the oppression baby because he's, <laughs> he's caught a Tamil, I mean, he's half Tamil and then caught a, a African American and caught a, you know, New York Jewish. So, <laughs> so you know. He's sort of, he's yeah, so handsome, beautiful. all of it. And Thank you. you, well, you we're inspired, gonna, we're, uh, one more thing. You inspired me to do a song called Love Yourself, Mathi, and it's on the YouTube. And it's you who, I would say it's your inspiration that made me do it. And any age that you could do it. And thank you for that. 
are, well, I'll see you after. And then I'll listen <laughs> to you. it. Thank <laughs> you. That's the first time I've seen an older relative praise a younger relative for mm. swearing. So <laughs> <laughs> hats off. <laughs> okay, over here. Hi. Um, First, I just got back from Sri Lanka a week and a half ago, and um, as an outsider, it seemed very peaceful and resolved, so I appreciate you continuing to use your voice because I wasn't aware that there was still so much to, to be done, so thank you for that. Um, I was curious, you mentioned earlier, obviously, that your success was much to um, the blogosphere and, and that sort of democratization of voice in that way, whereas now we're seen on the very flip side, and um, as you mentioned, they've kind of been gobbled up. Um, so. Do you see a way forward in terms of resolving that since that is so key to modern communication? Um, can we find our way back to a place where artists like you can succeed in that way? Uh, I don't think so. I think time always moves on. So the new thing, we don't know what that is. And the new MIA, we don't know what it would take because nobody knew the blogs were going to happen, you know? And we didn't know there was going to be MySpace or... You know what I mean? It's just sort of, it just happens when things line up, and it's it's that spontaneous thing of certain things lining up that creates something. And I wouldn't know what the new thing is, but it's um, I it, I think there is space for it though. Yeah, I'm sure that y young people are always thinking about that, because it must be super frustrating and actually super boring, you know, to, to, to sort of be, uh, be amongst like this sort of new generation where everything you do is a marketing thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like I walk into the bathroom and I get sold shower gel because it can pick the tap stripping, you know, and it's sort of, where do you go after that? And it's, it's a really, artistically, it's a really interesting time. And it's just a matter of, like, young people being brave enough to, to question it. Because at the moment, everyone's like, I love it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just about waiting yeah. until they get pissed off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Over here. To go with that statement, like, your music right now, you're talking about, like, all these different concepts. And you say, like, art can't be political. But have you ever thought about like uh, your legacy in terms of you know in 20, 30 years, like how music will be portrayed, like the message that carries on, like artists like Michael Jackson, David Bowie, you know, stuff like that. Those music, that music channels and carries on, but like other stuff that you're talking about, commercial stuff that just is for likes and stuff doesn't really carry on. Have you ever thought about your legacy? Because um, you're gonna have one, obviously. It's just like. <laughs> well. It's kind of weird because, you know, this is like some deep stuff, yeah. but <laughs> during 2009 when the Civil War was coming to an end, I, I had a baby, you know, so like there was a whole bunch of death in my life and then, and then there was this birth. And then after that, um, that sort of, because people say, oh, you know, maybe you didn't fight hard enough and, or, why are you still here, you know? <laughs> like, you're called MIA. Um, but I just feel like it, it's, it's sort of, I don't know, I'm inspired by creativity and what that is, and I, and I want to still explore that. You know, there's loads of things I feel like I haven't worked out, just, just in, in that sense of, um, evolving as a creative person or as an artist and I don't want to limit myself to music and I have kind of burnt a lot of bridges with a lot of music companies <laughs> and a lot of people in the music biz so it's a great kind of space to be in because I know I can't go backwards but um, yeah so it's just about I don't know maybe maybe I, it's weird yeah. thinking like that because I just thought that if I hadn't had a baby in 2009, I definitely would have died because that was like a very depressing time. And it, it took a lot, you know, and it took me giving birth to a child to get through that. And I guess that's what like the Maya album is. 
and past that, I haven't really thought about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have a legacy, like your music's inspired a lot of people, including myself, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have time for just a couple more, everybody. Try and keep it short. Thank you. All right, um, I wanted to ask you specifically about making records in America. And um, we talk about freedom of speech a lot in America and using that in quotations because I don't believe it's that free. Um, did you encounter a lot of um, censorship when you were working with labels in America? Yeah, but I don't think it was like a deliberate kind of censorship. It was just like, we don't get it kind of censorship, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Cool. So there wasn't anything that like you felt you couldn't say or not say. Did you? I just always said it. <laughs> cool. I I never censored myself, so I just like talk and say whatever I want to say. And some journalists were like, "Whoa, she's crazy," and some people were like, "You can't say that stuff." And they did try to media train me once when I came here, <laughs> and that went really bad. <laughs> like. <laughs> That went really bad. Um, so it just, it, it is kind of, um, yeah, no, I, I felt that Jimmy Iovine was used to, like, political artists, so he, he sort of was okay with it, but was trying to help me sort of become um, a pop star who didn't say a lot. So he would sort of advise me, like, don't you just kind of, you know, like, just just take the easy road. But I think when, um, when you're a Tamil and there's never been one before, I just, I just felt like, well, there's no definition. Like, why should I fit the mold of somebody else? And it just didn't make sense. And, yeah, what if all Tamil rappers talked about this you don't know because there isn't loads <laughs> so yeah yeah that was just kind of the thinking I was going with yeah thank you thank you hi go ahead hello my name is Javier um, I've been to your show in California about three times and I still buy your records <laughs> and um, I just want to let you know that you're like the only artist that like still to today you haven't toured in a while but you let your audience onto your stage. And I think that's a very special thing that you're like the only person, even though throughout your entire career, like every single time I went to your show. I think my fans are like the wildest and craziest well, and cleverest now, because well, they've just been really twice. pushed to the <laughs> edge. <laughs> and yeah, and also now I think they're the most compassionate, you know, they can take that off because of Steve's film, not my work. <laughs> But that, that's like, you know, it's nice that, that, that you could be like that at the show. And yeah. Well, don't ever change. And, um, Thank you. No, we're not, we're not, we're not going to take anything from the stage right now. But um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Neha. Um, one of my favorite lines of yours is, brown girl, brown girl, turn your shit down. Do you have any advice for a brown girl who's always been told to turn her shit down? <laughs> Don't. <laughs> yeah. I knew you were going to say that. I just wanted to hear it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. OK, real quick, everybody. Yeah, um, what would be a message that you would want to put into a song uh, to the Tamil people as a healing message? What message would I put to Tamil people yeah. right now? Um, right now, my whole sort of main focus is on, you know, one of the things that in the 10 years that we've had to do is just go with the whole human rights, because uh, we were relying on the UN heavily to back our story and to help us and get blah, blah, uh, you know, something done in the International Criminal Courts, which now they're going to get rid of. Um, hopefully they don't. Right, I think jury's still out, okay. Yeah, um, so I think now I would say just to go back to, you know, remembering and knowing that, that there, 
their story is very, it, it's not just about the 40 year struggle and that it goes back thousands of years and to, you know, and to sort of zoom out and see the bigger picture. And there was a really interesting thing about the South Indian film industry. Um, Hollywood, they were saying that up until the 90s, they only ever sold movies to four countries. You know, it was like Singapore and a couple of other countries. And since the, the war in Sri Lanka, now they sell to 32 different countries. And that is only possible because of the Sri Lankan, um, you know, immigrants all across the world or refugees. And that's like a positive story that comes out of a negative situation. And I think we have to focus on more things like that where we are building new connections and new ideas and investing more in creativity and exploring our identity and not just our identity within, you know, the Rajapaksha war context. Yeah. Thank you. Over here. Hi. Thank you guys for this experience. Honestly, when I first got up, I did not have a question. I was like, please, God, help me out by the time I get to the mic. Um, but... Thank you. Um, my question is, I'm an artist, and I'd like um, some advice on how I can manage to retain creative freedom um, the way you've done across different mediums. Like, I see you doing different things, including this film and music, um, and I admire that, and I'd like some advice on that. And also on what you're doing, given where you've come from, uh, me being a Haitian, a child of Haitian parents and you being Sri Lankan, how are you managing to overcome that trauma of a background and how are you sustaining yourself like spiritually and uh, emotionally? This is a short answer, right? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I just think that through every negative thing, there's positive things that come, you know, and, and that's, that's like, you just have to, you just have to believe in that, you know? And the trauma thing about, um, yeah, you carry your memory in your DNA and it, it's, it, that's what this film is. Have you seen the film? No, not yet. Well, it's exactly what this film is and hopefully that's what, you know, it empowers people like you because it shows when you're in going through something bad, you can always turn it and, and make something positive out of it, you know, and then it's just the way you remember it, you know. So it doesn't it doesn't always have to get logged as trauma. And if it does, you can always, you know, create something beautiful from it, you know, and that it's a lesson. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry we do not have time for other questions. She has to get downtown to another Q&A. You can catch her there, down on the Lower East Side. Thank you all for being here. You've been a terrific audience. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It. Bye.